Warning, World Worry Podcast occasionally discusses mature themes and uses colorful language. Welcome to World Weary Podcast. I'm the American doing hard time for stealing a ribbon, Cassiopeia Walker. And I'm the British one locked up for treason or something like that, Violet Star. I am the master of today's episode, so I chose today's topic. And today we're doing da 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 prison escapes. Prison break. <laughs> But uh, first, I want to start by saying I've been enjoying my four-day weekend off. But for us, it's been cocktail afternoon and relaxing. We've been getting some sunshine, having some drinks. Hmm. Anything exciting happen in the week that you want to share? Uh, this week's just been really crazy. Hmm. Like yesterday, I just literally led around all day. But I've had so much to do. And I've been having a lot of those days where I was like, okay, I need to get, you know... A whole list of stuff done yeah and i can't even get like a quarter of the way through the list <laughs> yeah i'm just trying to relax but yeah we've just been i've focused on the podcast editing doing lots of editing we're preparing for launch you, you know you won't know it by listening but we've been doing things behind the scenes here but i've been enjoying writing and stuff it's been fun getting excited every week to hear the story whatever story you're gonna tell me and stuff like that so i think that's like really positive but yeah so we aren't exactly criminal types ourselves. I think I almost stole a packet of gum once. And we, the, we're not criminals. We, <laughs> I don't think either of us have <laughs> ever been done for any kind of crime. Never been to jail. Yeah. I've barely <laughs> spoken to a police person <laughs> in my life. So are you? have you ever been afraid that maybe like, you know, sliding doors, maybe there's an alternate universe violet there in, definitely in is. the big pen? If there are alternate dimensions, I, you know, I have done everything. I've yeah. been charged for everything. I've been every kind of weird alien prison that is possible. <laughs> what, what do they call when children steal food from gardens? Like scrumping or? Oh, that's like apples. Scrumping. Okay, it's scrumping. like taking like apples apples okay let's say i I just thought you know i thought it was interesting because morgan has a lot of stories of thieving things from people's gardens as a child like where he would just steal it's very countryside yeah crime (laughs) yeah it sounds like a very countryside i think mainly mainly the worst stuff we got ended up doing was kind of things adults had had got us to do like trespass on military land or (laughs) go places you're not meant to go like my grandparents favorite day trips to take their grandchildren on were always something that involved hopping over a wall going through a a gate with a big private sign or like trespassers will be shot (laughs) if it had a sign saying you are not allowed here they were like more tempted they were like drawn to it like magnets (laughs) That's just, that, yeah, that sounds like a very specific crime. (laughs) The crime of trespassing. The crime of trespassing with your grandparents. That's dangerous. I think you can say we're both pretty lame. Yeah, Yeah, we're we're not not criminal types at all. No, we're pretty... I mean, I'm just too scared. I'm too scared (laughs) to do... I would be way too chicken to... To shoplift, even something tiny. Yeah, exactly. That's I just the thing. don't have it have it in me. I wait, always wait for the green man to light up before I cross the road. Like, <laughs> I'll press the like crossing button, like right in the middle wait of the night when there are no traffic. cars at all in the small town that we live in. That's fair enough. No, no, no. We're not exactly criminal types, so that's why probably why little stories like prison escapes and that are fascinating to me at least is the idea that someone not it's just only... too stressful like <laughs> can you imagine it's like i just couldn't i would be so stressed out by having ended up in a situation where i'm going to prison anyway which is like <laughs> a nightmare i've never even entertained because i'm such a goody two shoes yeah exactly i just want a safe easy life you know i used to have nightmares when i was a teenager about going to a debtor's prison <laughs> 
and I would wake up in the morning and I'd have to Google search to make sure that debtors prisons weren't still a thing in the UK. Oh my God. Luckily, they they died out a long, long time ago, long before I was born. They could bring them back. They could bring them back. I'm not even in any debt. I was just <laughs> that was just something I used to freak out about. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, so neither of us are very criminal. Like, but with my story, okay, so we're gonna go into prison escapes. My story is going to be in the 1830s, and I wanted to find an interesting one, but there's a lot that I want to lay down in front of you before we get to the prison escape itself. What I want to know is, what made you, what what do you love so much about prison escape stories? Because you, like, picked this, like, just kind of out of the blue, (laughs) and it was something I hadn't even thought of when I was thinking for episodes. Yeah. I was like, what a great idea. Well, okay, so I've, especially with old school history, we've talked about, like, the man in the iron mask and things like that. That sort of was the thing that set me off on my journey of, like, when I was a kid, watching documentaries and stuff about that, of what it would be like, like, to be in these horrible prison situations. I'm also obsessed with, like, medieval torture devices and what they use to, like, basically... Oh, I love that stuff. Oh, it's insane. And it actually... I don't want to bring it up right now, but, like, there's a lot of stuff to that as well. Like, it's just the idea of these horrible situations and how would you cope with it? How would you survive? And the people who somehow, against all odds, managed to escape that situation, to me, is fascinating. I, I sort of... it. Even if they've done terrible things, you kind of have this pang of, oh, well, they were clever enough mm. or well, whatever. Escapes are a great story, you know. They've yeah. got a plan and there's always a bit of a gamble and it's exciting. Yeah. And what what are the reasons behind why they are tr- been placed somewhere in the first yeah, place exactly. that they need to escape and what, what are they trying to get to? I don't know. I also always think about prison escapes of being kind of the documentaries I avoid when I'm flicking through like Sky yeah. TV or something. Because <laughs> it's always like, you know, there's very famous like there's war always a, escape yeah. stories. Yeah, they're cool and there's a reason that they're mm. so well known and famous and great. But it's like dad TV. <laughs> some of those like war escape stuff so today I was like kind of interested to are you trying to figure out if, if my superhero power would be becoming a middle aged dad well we know day. my superhero <laughs> power is becoming a, a tough old man yeah mine might be like a midwestern cheesy dad from Milwaukee or something who wants to have a beer and basically gives you non-committal advice about everything and hope everything comes together maybe that's my superhero my su- me. the reason i want for my superhero power to become a hench older man is primarily from a point of safety there's a lot of situations where i don't <laughs> want to look like me and i don't want to be a female when i'm walking <laughs> around like at night on my own so i'd love i feel so much safer i think if i could just turn into like a hench old dude yeah and then just secondly just a lot of scenarios i'd like to see what i could get away with yeah (laughs) things i could get away with saying to people yeah oh cheer up (laughs) someone just comes in and punches a lot of them and it just flies in and punches one of us (laughs) but uh yeah it's it's i don't know I find it so fascinating and why it felt like I had to talk about it but like there's some really good that was a good idea you know there's one that I want to talk about in a future episode there's there's so many good ones there's the classics but I don't think we're touching on the classics really today we've delved deep I've delved so deep that's what I mean some of the classics yeah are like dad stories they're like dad tv overdone and Mm. it's cool but I've heard them yeah, right, I want to go to some interesting places with some prison escapes. We're going to be going to some interesting places. <laughs> for sure. So we're, for mine, we're in 1830s. It's Ireland. It's going to get rough. So trigger warning. Uh, if, you, if you're upset by poverty, <laughs> you might want to skip this one. So... I have to basically cover a couple things that are integral to understanding the rest of the story before we even get to the prison escape. Okay. It's 1830s Ireland. It's riddled with poverty and poor conditions, and they have an ill-timed famine going on. Specifically, Limerick City, where we are, where the Limerick, the Limerick prison is, 
what I'm going to read to you is from a travel journalist from Scotland. Henry D. Inglis wrote a book. It's called Ireland in 1834, A Journey Throughout Ireland. And this book, as well as uh, others, can be found at archive.org. And here's the quote about the conditions that's particularly relevant as we move forward. I found too dreadful confirmation of the very worst reports. I spent a day in visiting those parts of the city where the greatest destitution and misery were said to exist. I entered upwards of 40 of the abodes of poverty, and to the latest hour of my existence, I can never forget the scenes of utter and hopeless wretchedness that presented themselves that day. So, <laughs> so nice. It's, it's not great. And no. this is a, it's a bad time. It's not great. He also goes on in the book about the people themselves, workers, craftsmen, women, who could barely get by, and they are being given extremely poor and unsuitable wages. And at the same time, rents and living expenses are going up. It was a time when landlords and employees could easily exploit their tenants and employees. And at this time as well, there is a sense that people knew they had no hope of a better future. They know they're in a rut and then it's a for the next 20, 30 years could be like mm. that. So they already were desperate and things are boiling. And there's nothing to stop the poor becoming completely destitute and deceased, living very short but miserable lives. And these conditions begin to lead to food riots. We know nowadays that terrible conditions in an apathetic or laissez-faire government equal rioting. We've seen it before in history. We can kind of nowadays look back. I mean, even as early as the LA riots, there's a lot of poor conditions and unfair conditions and stuff. So we can see these things in history and riots occur when these things happen. So in the summer of 1830, things start to really boil over. This is from the Belfast news split, newsletter on 29th of June, 1830. 13 drays with potatoes were coming from Navin to Dublin Market. Is that how you say it? Navin? I'm not Navin to Dublin Market. They were attacked in Dunshanglin by a mob headed by a woman. The sacks were cut and 22 some bunches of potatoes carried off. So they stole some potatoes. Okay. And this is from uh, the Chronicle at the time. The figure and aspect of the women in emerging from the stores were most ludicrous character. So bedogged were they with flour, head, face, and clothes. So ridiculous was the plight in which they ran through the streets and so disordered their dress as to resemble in truth rather a horde of wild Indians than a number of civilized beings. So this is a, a newspaper at the time mm. reflecting how even the newspaper and journalists see the poor. Mm. So they're saying they're focused more on the clothes and how the women appear after riding for food. They've basically sacked this flour mill and taken as much flour as possible and run with it. And they're cutting potatoes out of fucking bear. They're getting desperate, and it's all led by women, right? So you know it's bad times mm. when women are getting involved in that manner and really starting riots. Because women tend to, correct me if I'm wrong, in survival situations, think about their children and their families eating things first. Like, So food riots continue, um, but this is from the Limit Chronicle in 21st of July, 1831. Heard by their numerous friends and relatives, this is after the riots, with the most alarming indications of despair and consternation. The silence of a moment was succeeded by loud and terrific gestures. Those unfortunate people had never calculated that the scandalous plunder of their fellow citizens' property would ever expose them to any punishment, much less a severe and exemplary one. So they're coming down hard on these people mm. who were rioting for food, who were already poor and destitute. The 25th of June was to them a memorable day, and the enormous pillage of private property an act of triumph and exaltation among the poorer classes but 14 individuals were sentenced to seven years' transportation, which leads us into transportation. Way. I've gotten the following from historyplace.com in, in their essay, Irish Potato Famine, subtitled Coffin Ships. During the famine period, an estimated half million Irish were evicted from their cottages. Unscrupulous landlords used two methods to remove penniless tenants. The first involved applying for a legal judgment against the male head of the family owing back rent. 
and then after the local barrister pronounced judgment, the man would be thrown in jail and his wife and children dumped on the streets. A notice to appear was usually enough to cause most pauper families to flee, and they were handed out by the hundreds. Kind of similar to what's going on today in a way. Mm. This is just a hint at one of the ways people are suddenly becoming poor. So people who were fine, but like maybe missed a couple payments, were all of a sudden being basically paupered. Mm. So even if you think you're comfortable middle class dude, things are being stirred up so you're financially hoodwinked essentially. And the women would sometimes turn to sex work in order to feed themselves and their family. And this led to a lot of nastiness around stereotypes and made it where it was easy for largely religious and judgmental groups at the time and most average people to turn their backs on their own people by labeling them as uh, uh, prostitutes on the whole instead of seeing them as like, you know, some people have to turn to sex work to survive or for whatever reason. So from an essay by Jean Murray entitled The Law Must Take Its Course, Limerick Women Sentenced to Transportation. During the first half of the 19th century, a large number of women from Limerick City and County were sentenced to transportation to Australia by the courts. And during the period 1826 to 1857, an estimated 552 Limerick women were so sentenced. Violent offenses, however, constituted only a small fraction of the cases. If you look at the chart, it's insane. It's all young women petty theft, like a cloth. So typical prosecutions were for stealing potatoes, stealing apron, stealing pig, larceny of five hand handkerchiefs, stealing sugar. Not major offenses by modern standards. In fact, we would judge them as quite petty, but crimes that could be treated fairly harshly under the legal code of the 19th century, early 19th century. Mm. One uh, unfortunate soul, Ellen Broderick, age 24, was actually transported in 1828 for vagrancy. So he just stood about. Right? So, so Mary up. Meehan, 22, was sent to Australia on board the Lady Rowena in 1825 for sailing one single umbrella. When you keep in mind the, the early history of Australia as a transportation colony for men at the start, they had a dis disparity between men and women. So they're essentially sending these women who are forced prostitutes, forced sex workers, over to Australia to basically be sex workers. Super That's what they're sending. It, yeah. They're taking young women, mm -hmm. age 12. Girls as young as 12 are known to have been transported for quite trivial misdemeanors. In October 37, 1837, for instance, Mary Hennessy, age 12, a kitchen maid, was transported for stealing a quilt that she pawned to buy bread. She sailed for Australia on board the Diamond, leaving Cove in Cork Harbor on 15th November 1837, arriving in Sydney four months later. So now that we know how the system worked back then, especially for women who are starving to death, I'll introduce you to the cast of characters. Let's do it. Limerick City! <laughs> the names of the nine convicts. And the whole point is that these women, when they get sentenced, they're going to be transported soon. They're only in here as a temporary holding till they get transported forever from their homeland to Australia to most likely become sex workers. That's just a fact. Mary King, Mary Hurley, Mary Kevin and her infant, 11 months old, Ellen Hurley, her sister, uh, Mary Hurley's sister, Margaret Shaughnessy, Margaret Clanchy, Bridget Shelton, Mary Hickey and Catherine Welsh. This is our cast of characters. So, how many is all that together? It's nine, nine, including nine. the baby. <laughs> so, the women are scheduled to be transported, and it's not clear whether it's North America or Australia. It's most likely Australia, considering the numbers. Uh, but there's very the reason why I wanted to paint the picture is because there's only one article from the. Um, Monmouthshire Merlin on 30th of May 1830 that even talks about this. So there's very little known about these women. The newspapers at the time paint them all as just dirty, savage people and that they're criminals so they don't deserve your compassion. So they're not going to highlight. Nowadays, you'd be like, nine women and a baby. Like, and it'd be really mm. almost, they'd be like underdogs, but 
back then there was such a fear of the poor that they're in a, in a hate that they state the facts and this is all that's known about this escape all right so the nine convicts had been for some days before secretly provided with a file and an aquafortis, also a short iron bar or poker in order to facilitate their liberation. So they've been given these tools a few days before they're to be transported for good. Two men from the outside scaled the prison walls between 9 and 10 o'clock on Sunday night. You'd be like, how come no one's seen this? Mm. By means of a ladder used by workmen in repairs of the jail, gained an easy access to the women's ward. The object was accomplished without much difficulty, as singular to say, the exterior of the jail is shrouded in solitary darkness. No lamp being hung out as a beacon to keeper or watchman, and the passage after nightfall is seldom trodden by human footsteps. So they don't have any guards, and they don't have any lights. Now came the trial of ingenuity, for the locks of a range of cells were to be forced and the inmates enlarged without disturbing the few persons in charge of the prison or breaking that lonely silence which hung over the building. However, the prisoners frequently indulged in singing after nightfall. This amusement they enjoyed with more than any ordinary spirit on this occasion. So, like, this night they're getting all extra rowdy because they know what's up. And without exciting any particular notice, Meantime, the iron fastenings were assailed by the burglars, so they're like literally breaking the women out while everyone out, all the women in the ward are singing like, oh. <laughs> The sound of their operations was so drowned in the melody of the accompanying voices as not to reach the ears of the jail governor or his assistants. The locks gave way before repeated efforts, and nine females with an infant were extracted from Durant's vial. Nice. So they just got some ladders and like was like wah, 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 and grab the baby. This was a grand object at the outset, but the work was yet incomplete. And after a brief consultation, the ladder was again in request. One after the other rapidly mounted the wall which confines the ward, and sat perched in a row on the summit while the ladder was being drawn over and laid down against the other side, which they descended in perfect silence. So they flip it up, flip it up, back run into up. the yard. Everyone, yeah. The third and outer wall was carried by a similar coup without the slightest accident, and the 11 persons made their escape into the street unnoticed by any of the persons on watch. The consternation of the jailer, turnkeys, and keepers next morning, it is easier to imagine than describe. The sheriffs and police have been incessantly on the alert through every part of the city and liberties, and one of the nine convicts, Mary Hickey, was apprehended in the abbey. So obviously one of them was like feeling guilty and went to go pray and okay. got done in the yeah. abbey. Right. Their capture may probably lead to the detections of others who it is believed have not fled away, but are concealed by some of their friends in town. The most extraordinary feature in this daring and successful enterprise is the breaking of the great iron locks. It absolutely puzzles every officer how these could have possibly been forced without that application of violence which must have been roused by its noise, the most dormant and inattentive person within the prison. There is no further reports after this in the Monmouthshire Merlin, so we can assume that everyone but Mary got away with it. That's sweet. Day. Yeah. So who was it that got them out? The, that's the thing. I can't find anything on... Who was the warden? Maybe it was like a relative or something, or like an inside job, this is what or like I'm, a yeah, partner I, or something. Like that's it's a, a women's of... ward. It could have been they could have come from the male prison. Oh yeah, or from outside. Yeah, like Pretty friends easily. or relatives or something. Just be like taken over. That's what I'm. This is the taken thing. control. If anybody knows, this is what, so I definitely ask if anybody knows more about Irish history or has any more information. I mean, if I got jailed for stealing like some yeah. potatoes and none of them or were, yeah. like a duvet or whatever i would want <laughs> my friends and family to try and break oh, yeah. me out in secret at night like yeah and that's the thing if if you if the punishment is because they'll do that if they ever colonize other planets they'll do transportation again it's an easy way to get rid of poor people it's gonna be just there's gonna be so many brilliant they're like movies to me right now of like alien prison break situations <laughs> like humans transported to prison it's just all of those sci-fi 
kind of trashy yeah. series that I love that involve alien human prisons on alien planets. Well, because that was a short but sweet prison break, I've got a special mention for you. Ooh, okay. The same prison. Let's go for it. So Patrick Mc, 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 McMahon, 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 in 1861, so 30 years later, he actually broke into the jail uh, in order to dance with the devil whom he had met previously when he first went to prison. So apparently the devil had first appeared to Patrick with his horns and tail and chains and fiery eyes. On the night of the first apparition, he claimed that the devil danced and sang songs while all the inmates gathered, looked on, and even joined in the merriment. He also said by chance he met his sable majesty, who danced the butcher's dance before his very the eyes. Butcher's dance? I, have, I think it's the devil's dance. Okay. Like with the butcher's knife, oh God, like I some guess. sausages, lasso them around <laughs> your head. And others who were present there and then and there when he, in the highest key, struck up that lively air. So the guy writing this is a prisoner. Uh, the guy writing this is a is from the eighteen sixty one article. He saw this. He saw saw a devil. Yeah, yeah. Devil. He, this is his quote. While he was a prisoner in prison. Yes, during the celebration, someone tried to whistle, but it was like me, where they can't whistle properly. Like, uh, and so the Satan was very offended, and so he used all of his Luciferian strength that in the middle of this dance jam. To punch this guy so hard in the jaw, he spun. This sounds like a guy tripping out in prison, <laughs> witnessing a commotion and a fight between two other prisoners. The place I got this for, it's very clear that perhaps maybe this is a case of, uh... This know. is like someone off the head in in jail. Okay, so... Years Creepy. later, upon hearing that Satan would once again be making his return rounds at the jail, he had to go back and see him again. So he scaled the wall, got into jail, um, into his old cell. But because he got caught, he ended up in court. And in court, he begged the mayor to let him back to his cell to slay the devil. And here's the quote. One week was all he asked, in which the, this man of doubtless mental engaged, unaided alone, the evil one to settle. Provided in a certain cell they put him, and no other, for there and there alone he'd meet the tempter of our mother. This is a crazy man story. <laughs> yes. He begged to go back, he tried to break back into his old prison cell, then begged to be sent back into jail so that he could slay the devil, that's his new mission. So they basically marched him off to jail amid his crazy. convulsive laughter. And far from being affrighted at what he undertook to do, he appeared right well delighted. As the Irish Times at the time reported, Pat gave his reason for breaking into the jail that night, but neglected to mention the other complaints, such as disorderly and gambling in public street, drunk in the public street, and committing a larceny of rags, two other charges of disorderly conduct as well, but dismissed. For his night's work in total, Pat Mc McMahon was sentenced to six hours of solitary confinement for being disorderly and gambling in public, one day's hard labor for being drunk on top of a sixpence fine, and a further 14 days of hard labor for stealing the rags. And finally, as reported, the judge ordered he be remanded in the city jail until May 23rd and returned for climbing into the prison the night before. A seven-night stay at his own request for breaking into his fa favorite cell. Crazy man. That is <laughs> yes. just the story of... A, you imagine the kind of guy that tells you, I need to break back in and be put back in prison so I can slay the devil who I saw punch another prisoner in the face once and dance a jig. Yeah. That is a hundred percent definitely a lunatic some, story. Yeah. But yeah that's that's uh the story of the Limerick Nine and Patrick McCann of the same jail. Very cool stories. Very yeah. cool. I like the mass escape. I have questions that will never be answered. That's unfortunate. If anyone knows anything else about this, let us know. But there's virtually nothing on it. So it's a bit upsetting. Sometimes you need a bit of a mystery, though. Yeah. That's what it's about. Something to, to ponder on. That's why I put my theories at the top <laughs> of why they were in jail versus and why they had to get out. So we understood them a little better than just, oh, it's prison escape. 
But yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a prison break story that I found that I found super fascinating just from the um what's it called? What's the thing when you title a YouTube video to Clickbait. I was drawn in by the clickbait of this. <laughs> um, in a way, but it did turn out to be a super cool story. This is the story of Alexander Pierce. We are also in this story. There's lots of parallels today. That's oh, really? why I was having to keep quiet a bit in that first in, oh, in your shit. story. Because it's like, I know it, it, it they ver they almost kind of run parallel in oh, a way, wow. like, but with different issues going yeah. on. So it's, they're going to complement each other well today. It's going to be a very particular niche theme for okay. today's episode now. We are in the early 19th century again. Okay. We're in 1819. Okay. We're following the story of a poor farm labourer called Alexander Pierce. And in 1819, he's about 29, 30 years old, and he is being sentenced in the county town of Armagh, County Armagh, Ireland. Oh, We're wow. back in Ireland, Ireland in the same period. Wow. Maybe a little bit earlier, a little bit earlier. Ten years. He has been charged with the theft of six pairs of shoes. So petty. So, so petty. petty. And for punishment, he is transported. Oh, to... how did I, I didn't know what you were doing. I did not know what you... I saw a name and I avoided anything to do with that name. I didn't even see that name come up when I was searching mine. But see, I was specifically is, searching for women. Like, women prisoners. This space. runs in a... It's great because, the you know, these wow. run these run parallel but without colliding, yeah. which is kind of cool. Show you both sides of how men affected and how women were affected. His punishment. He is transported to... Van Diemen's Land, which we now know as the island of Tasmania of the south of Australia. Oh boy. Here's a little bit of, of history to fill in some extra stuff oh. about uh, convict transportation. Um, so we, the British, had been sending convicts overseas <laughs> since the 17th century, firstly to America, and then after Captain Cook claimed possession of the east coast of Australia, the British government decided to start transporting our convicts there and establishing these penal colonies, basically settlements made up of convicts, starting with, I think, Sydney was, was one of the first yeah. penal colonies. And by doing this, we were expanding the empire and stopping other countries, like the French, from <laughs> expanding across Australia. It was seen as uh, a solution to overcrowding and crime in Britain. And, you know, for some people it was, you know, putting criminals to good use. A fresh start, settle down and help fuck up a continent on the other side of the world. In some cases, if you, the convict, you know, if you behaved or you survived out your sentence abroad, you could be given a kind of ticket or like a certification of freedom you could go on to establish yourself as a regular settler or a farmer or whatever or you know there are even occasions you were able to return to to your homeland yeah once you've done done your time so a lot of the convicts that uh, were transported were charged on those petty crimes and misdemeanors you know the small time crooks thieves thugs and just poor people Carrying out petty crimes to survive, yeah. basically. And smelly homeless people that and, are just doing yeah. nothing but being vagrant. The unwanted, yeah, you know, exactly. and, and the people really suffering at, at, the, at the bottom rungs yes. of society at the time. So people like rapists and murderers, you know, serious crimes, what they were actually more likely to be sentenced to death in Britain yes. at the time rather than be transported. So, you know, we weren't necessarily always sending out the worst of the worst exactly, abroad. Yeah. So, you know, like in Alexander Pierce, um, in his case, charged for, you know, stealing shoes, he, is, he totally fits the bill, petty crime, he gets transported to Tasmania, and at the time that he gets transported, Tasmania was probably the primary penal colony in Australia. So that was where ev they were shipping everyone off to. 
Once he arrives at the penal colony, he doesn't behave. Pierce commits various crimes, probably like thefts or assaults of some kind, something bad enough to kind of get get yourself uh, a bit of a reputation. And in May 1822, he is reported in the local newspaper as having absconded from the penal colony. So he's gone into hiding or he's run out of town to escape going into custody. And a £10 reward is promised to anyone that can capture him and bring him to the authorities. Pierce is captured relatively quickly and he's sentenced once again with uh, a transportation in a way. <laughs> but when you're already in the main penal colony, you know, the place they've shipped all the convicts to, where do they put you? In the new, new colony? So he is transported to the new Macquarie Harbour Penal Station Ugh, on Sarah so Island. Bad. You're gonna shit in a hole for weeks. It's just off the coast of Tasmania. It's a little island, only about twenty acres in size. Oh wow! And it had literally just opened for business that year. Paradise. <laughs> or is it? <laughs> so the penal colony on Van Diemen's Land, aka Tasmania, you know, that already was the place where they were kind of sending the bad guys. This is where they are sending criminals they don't want in Ireland or Britain. Uh, so that makes a place like Macquarie Harbour, this little island, the place where the bad, bad guys go. Oh, wow. um, it very quickly gains a reputation for being one of the harshest penal settlements in Australia. This was the place where the worst of the worst went. It was effectively a prison where you could banish the most dangerous criminals or, as in Alexander Pierce's case, convicts who had escaped or absconded from the penal colony. They right. weren't playing by the rules. They were trying to get out. So this was basically a hellhole maximum security prison. First off, it's an isolated island hundreds of miles away from the nearest penal settlements on the Tasmanian mainland. The land the land around it was a mountainous wilderness. Oh. So when you if you tried to go, you know, swim back to the Tasmanian mainland from this island, you had miles of inhospitable Gosh. mountainous nothing before you even got to the other settlements. The stretch of sea that separated the island from the mainland was quite literally treacherous. Oh no. So dangerous was it that the only passage to the island was along a narrow rocky sea channel known as Hell's Gates. Oh lovely. The tidal currents were so strong here even along this passage that was deemed the only way to access the island, that ships would often become wrecked on the rocks before they reached the island, and thus many convicts died at sea before even making it to oh the penal gosh, station. So mo a lot of people just died, they didn't even make it to this hellhole yeah. penal station. And maybe, you know, they lucked out in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> so insanely dangerous was access to and from the island that the surveyor who actually mapped the area stated that the chance of escape from Sarah Island was next to impossible. Of those that did attempt to escape from the island, many drowned crossing the sea passage, or when they reached the mainland, they died from starvation in the wilderness, oh. because there was nothing there. Of the convicts that actually survived the journey, when they arrived at Macquarie Harbour, the conditions were, unsurprisingly, grim. Yeah. Food couldn't be produced on the island, and thus the entire penal settlement relied on supplies sent by ship. And of course, the sea is so dangerous that those supplies didn't always make it. Because of the limited food, the convicts were severely malnourished, uh, diseases like scurvy and dysentery were, were rife, the settlement was so overcrowded that in their communal barracks, the convicts couldn't even sleep on their backs, they all had to like be sardined in on their oh. sides. You couldn't even roll onto your back to go to sleep. When the penal station was first established, the island was heavily forested with pine trees. So, you know, they decided the convicts there could be tasked with things like shipbuilding or getting wood oh, no, prepared for that's furniture. That's scurvy with the pine needles. The labour was 
Uh, as you can imagine, pretty heavy and brutal. You know, they were made to work in cold and wet weather. If you were caught slacking off or misbehaving, even, you know, the most trivial stuff, you would receive some kind of corporal punishment. So this place had a bad rep. Crims didn't want to go there. Um, they would chain the convicts up and they had them cut the trees isolated, down. isolated, so it's anything goes to whatever sicko's in charge. 100%. And then they would raft those logs down river until they had deforested the entire island. Oh no! They also constructed a shipyard and built a giant wooden wall along one side of the island because they needed to create shelter from these insane gale force winds that kept destroying and like blowing up the whole harbour on the island. It's It's as bad times. This is not... A fun paradise island. No, it's not. It's windy. It's hard work. There's so many, so many bad times happening. Most of the convicts housed at the penal station were men, but there was a small number of women transported there, who at first were made to live off of the north side of the island on a tiny rocky outcrop called Grummet Island. Fuck that. Fuck yeah. Grummet Island. I live on the Grummet Island bit. And I I'll share a picture of this at some point, but I'm not joking. It's women. a couple of rocks and a tree they just know, like, like in the water they're mainly off the island. comfort women as well because there's so... The ratio of men to women was crazy back then in Australia. It's just a little gross. Eventually, Grummet Island was deemed unlivable, even for the small group of female prisoners that had been housed there in probably pretty rudimentary shelter. Yeah. So, here you go, ladies. <laughs> Grummet Island then became a solitary confinement facility. Basically, of course, they're giving women what would turn out to be the, the <laughs> solitary confinement, nastiest place you can get on the island, the worst punishment you can get. That's where they were chucking the women first. It was the last resort hellhole within the hellhole. Oh my gosh. Any convicts that, you know, really stepped out of line. They were liberally, liberally flogged or whipped, but convicts that, you know, misbehaved or became uncontrollably violent or dangerous, they were sailed across to Grummet Island to spend the night as a punishment. It just sounds like maybe, like, it's, like, the 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 prison version, the prison place in, like, the Muppet world. Yeah, there's like, what I mean, it's like Wallace and Gromit or, like, oh, yeah, Muppet, yeah. Muppet solitary confinement oh, island. God. So, because there's no wharf on Grummet Island, the solitary confinement convicts would have to jump out of the boat and swim or wade through the sea until they got ashore. They would then have to sleep naked or suffer in wet clothes until the morning came, when they might be sailed back to the main island to get on with the hard labour. So bad was the reputation of the Macquarie Harbour Penal Station that almost understandably, some convicts would rather die than be (laughs) transported there. In 1824, barely two years after it opened, and news, you know, doesn't travel as fast then as it does now, two years, a prisoner at a separate Australian penal settlement stabbed another convict so that he could be executed (laughs) rather than face imprisonment at Macquarie Harbour Penal Station. Totally shit. So, back to our convict, Alexander Pierce. He's on one of the first ships of convicts to be sent to Macquarie Harbour, and it was in those early years at the penal station that conditions were probably at their worst. Oh, yeah. Everything, you know, was at its extreme in terms of shittiness. Hmm. Here's your stick. Here's a rock. Here's some chains. And then they'll proceed to take those things back and beat you with them. (laughs) Here's some scurvy. Bad times. Anywho, so from here on, I just have to point out, as usual, as with pretty much every story that I cover, there are some pretty major discrepancies and inconsistencies Um, And the version of events changes a lot, even in the official accounts, I suppose we'll call them. So I'm just piecing this together as best I can. We just have to use our imagination and a pinch of salt. September 20th, 1822. Pierce has been, you know, at Macquarie Harbour for most of the summer. 
Mm. And he's gotten to know some of the other hardcore kind of convicts. On this particular day, he's working on the eastern side of the harbour with seven other convicts. Alexander Dalton, Thomas Bodenham, William Kennelly, Matthew Travers, Edward Brown, John Martha and Robert Greenhill. It seems they stole a small vessel and successfully sailed across to the Tasmanian mainland together. Nice. They make it ashore. They survive the wow. insane Hell's Gate killer sea passage. However, they are now confronted with miles and miles of mountainous wilderness. Yeah. Most of which is completely inhospitable unless you have the right knowledge of how to survive there. One of the convicts, Robert Greenhill, had managed to smuggle an axe off of the island and thus he appoints himself leader of the escapee <laughs> gang. Fair enough, okay. He's supported in this by fellow escapee and good friend Matthew Travers because he and Greenhill had actually been sent to Macquarie Harbour Penal Station together after they had stolen a boat from a wealthy merchant in a failed attempt to escape a different penal colony in Tasmania. Um, these escaped convicts start marching through the Tasmanian wilderness, led by Greenhill brandishing his axe. Fifteen days in. Oh no, here's... All of them are suffering from severe starvation. Oh no. They are so hungry that they decide to draw lots to determine who would be killed for food. No. 15 days is really all... It only takes a couple weeks for us to become complete savages. Maybe less. I think I give you five days before I start looking at you like you're a bo box of Popeye's chicken <laughs> the side of fucking refried rice or something. Worst game ever. Yeah. <laughs> if you draw the short straw, you I will be killed. I always do. I would become... I'd be like, can we just take an arm? Can I just t sacrifice one arm for you guys? And then we take it in lots. We just each sacrifice an arm. An arm will last. But then you get that flavor. You get the taste. <laughs> Thomas Bodenham draws the short straw. Uh, Bodenham! <gasps> Greenhill swiftly murders him with the axe. No! Oh my god, they were serious. The convicts start to eat his body. They don't even cook it or nothing. I don't know. I'm oh. assuming they cook it. I'm, 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 I think they could probably get around to They're not barbarians! <laughs> However, at this point, three of the group, Brown, Kennelly, and possibly also Dalton, mm. they freak out. Yeah, yeah, that'll do it. They are traumatised by the cannibalism, and they seems they also fear that they may be next on the menu. <laughs> So the three of them break away from the group and they actually start heading back to try and get back towards Macquarie Harbour Penal Station. Oh, shit. Back to where they came from, the very place they've all escaped from, you know, to give themselves up. However, on the way back, or as they try to kind of head back that way, uh, Dalton appears to have died from exhaustion. Um, Brown and Kennelly do get picked up. Um, they get put in the prison hospital. However, they are in such bad shape, like real bad, you know, yeah. starvation, exhaustion, bad physical condition, that they die, you know, very quickly yeah. afterwards. Our convict Pierce, then, he's left in the wilderness with Greenhill, who has the axe, <laughs> his friend Travers, and this other guy called Mr. Mothers. At this point, basically, the wolves have been separated from the sheep. Yeah. Because we have now got Four people left, four of the hardest, most fucked up convicts, who not only escape from the harshest, most brutal penal station in yeah. Tasmania, but they also just killed and eaten another convict, and they didn't really freak out about it. No, you know, they, they, they did what they, they destroyed the weakest in the they pack. wanted to do. And the sheep have separated. The Jeez. sheep tried to run away, and they die. So these four are marching along together knowing that this is now an eat-or-be-eaten situation yeah, they know if the they rules. don't find some other kind of food yeah. source. Because Greenhill and Travers are like best buddies and Greenhill has the axe, yeah. Pierce realises that either himself or Mr. Mothers, the other guy, yeah. are next they're to be next, eaten. They're next because they're going to be more hesitant. They, they've got a real relationship with that person, you know. 
So Pierce starts sucking up to Green Hill and Travers. You know, he's like, he's trying like, to buddy up me with her. He's like, you know, I love what you don't do with those rags, man. You know, lots <laughs> of guys can't pull off the emaciated look, but you know, he's really cool. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's you really know what you're doing with seasoning, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> considering our limited resources. Steve was great. You know, Steve was superb. <laughs> God. When it comes to the question of who should die next, Pierce like sides with Green Hill and Travers, and Mister Mathers is axed oh, no. to death oh. and eaten. Mister Mothers, the escaped cannibal convicts lived much <laughs> another day. <laughs> The only problem is that Pierce is the third wheel now, and that means yeah, he's, he's next, he's next he's, on the menu. Everyone knows. Travis is sitting there like, I'm fine. Until a stroke of luck. Did Travis, Greenhill's sidekick, is bitten on the foot <gasps> by a snake. Yes! Travis, Sorry, Travis. <laughs> Travis becomes very unwell, um, whether it's poisoning or an infection from the bite, you know... Mm. He's, he's not in good shape and he becomes too weak to keep up Green Hill can't bear to kill his best friend just yet so he insists that Pierce and he carry Travers they carry Travers for five days oh. uh, but it's clear you know Travers is dying there's no hope of recovery for him by the yeah. end of that so Green Hill kills him with the axe and they eat him oh. Hopefully not the, like, infected leg yeah. foot part. Now it's just Pierce and Green Hill. Well, I mean, at that point, how are you sleeping soundly? They are not. <laughs> they are not sleeping at all. Um, so they've survived in the wilderness by killing and eating their fellow escapees and friends. They seem to have pressed on with the journey a little bit after Travers dies, but they are both starving and tired. They also both know that they want to murder each other <laughs> rather than be murdered. Yeah, of course. So what starts is basically a very slow, weakened fight. Basically a game of cat and mouse, possibly over a few days, but with two emaciated, starved, dying, crazy convicts. They were so exhausted, they're both like nodding off. Oh, wow. As they go along, to the point where it was literally only the stress of knowing that the other man was trying to kill you that was, like, keeping them from, like, fully falling asleep. Ugh. Greenhill still had the possession of the axe, so he might, like, I don't know, try and chase Pierce, take a swing at him, you know, Pierce stumbles away and escapes, maybe try and take the axe off Greenhill, some very slow motion wrestling. Yeah. But they're both so tired that they're literally passing out as this happens. Jeez. Eventually, it seems like they both collapse. Greenhill actually like falls asleep from exhaustion, and Pierce has enough wits on him to seize the axe before Greenhill can react. Oh, wow. He then kills Greenhill with the axe, oh, no. and he eats him. Oh gosh! Pierce continues to traverse the wilderness alone. When he encounters an Aboriginal camp, which he raids for food, sustains himself for a few more days. He continues to trek, and then he sees sheep. <gasps> After almost two months wandering the wilderness, wow. this is like finding the sparkling oasis. Yeah. You know, because he's, you know there's water nearby. You he's know reached the edge of settlement. Sheep. <sighs> and there's food. Yeah. He's happily eating away at a lamb <gasps> when he's interrupted by a very pissed off shepherd. But Pierce lucks out again because it turns out the shepherd is actually an old friend of his. Oh, wow. The shepherd, you know, sorts him out, shelters him back at the settlement, and Pierce is introduced to William Davis and Ralph Churton, wanted bushrangers. The bushrangers was like a term given to escaped convicts. Who, yeah, went out into the ra bush rather than... Exactly. Yeah, I remember this. They, they hide out uh, in the Australian bush or, you know, they're criminals who kind of use the out outback as a base. So these guys were making a living from stealing sheep. And so Pierce joins their sheep stealing ring and he actually survives as a bush ranger for about a month or two. 
however, around January 1823, so this is 113 days after he'd made his escape from Macquarie yeah. Harbour, his luck starts to come to an end, and he, along with the sheep thieves, Davis and Churton, are captured by the authorities. No! Davis and Churton, they've got a bad rep as bushrangers. They've got a whole bunch of offences stacked up behind them, <laughs> so they could just get hanged. Oh, no. Pierce, um, he's locked up in Hobart Town Jail in Tasmania, whilst the authorities deliberate on what to do with him. The Reverend Robert Knopwood, who was not only the chaplain, but also the magistrate at Hobart. Oh, lovely. He wants to know what happened to the other escapees who <laughs> fled from Macquarie Harbour with Pierce. So, Pierce actually confesses to him the entire account that I have just told wow. you. You know, how they killed and ate their fellow convicts until it was just him left. Reverend Knockwood doesn't believe Pierce's story. He didn't believe Pierce to be capable of cannibalism, and he thinks that Pierce is covering for the others and that they're all still hiding out oh, in the I bush. See. He's taken a hit for the tea. Yeah. That's what this guy thinks. Because other than Pierce's confession, there wasn't really any hard proof. Kennelly and Brown, who quit the escape party, you know, after that first cannibal situation and actually went back to the penal station, they died very shortly afterwards in the prison hospital, apparently without making, you know, any report that got recorded yeah. about what had happened in the wilderness. So all we have is Pierce's word and the fact that these escaped convicts went into the wilderness and other than those that turned back, Pierce was the only one to come out alive on the yeah. other side. So, they don't believe Pierce. He's spared the death penalty because they don't believe him, but they send him back to oh, no. Macquarie Harbour Penal Station, the island prison hellhole! No. However, Pierce is, from now on, probably pretty determined to free himself. You know, he'd already yeah, done it. He'd done Pierce. it once before and, and survived a while eating people. So... Literally within that year, within eighteen twenty three people to come with him. <laughs> literally manages to escape from the inescapable hellhole island for a second time. W along with a young convict called Thomas Cox. They make it to the mainland, um, and we don't know exactly what happened, but after about ten days, Pierce is found and captured by the authorities alone. <laughs> he was found with a supply of regular food on him. So, you know, he must have raided a settlement yeah. or a camp or come across some animals or something. But where was Thomas Cox, the convict who escaped with Pierce? They find some of Cox's body parts in Pierce's pockets. Oh no. Munching on them. Oh no. Even though he had a load of regular food to survive oh, well, that's on. The thing. Humans, there's something that's supposed to happen to you because I one day we'll do the Donner party but this one is once you get a taste for it that's it there's been other cases where people actually go nuts and sort of then crave it Ugh. Ugh, sorry listeners I, I can't, we should have candles <laughs> but yeah so Pierce confesses that he had killed an Eaton Cox Ugh. because he was a hindrance According to Pierce, the two had come upon a river, but Cox could not swim. Therefore, Pierce decided to murder him. Pierce is taken to the Supreme Court and tried and convicted of murder and cannibalism. Some found his account difficult to believe based upon the observation that Pierce did not look like a cannibal. Well, well there's your proof. What does a cannibal look like, you know? Basically, Pierce, apparently, he was quite a strong guy, but he was pretty short, even for the time. Like, he was like five foot two, five oh, three. That was short even for then, for a, for a man. And that didn't match up to the kind of gluttonous, yeah. monstrous image they, they had of Cannibal. He was quite like a feeble guy. Yeah. I mean, now I've watched enough, like, serial killer Cannibal <laughs> documentaries to know that actually, maybe, like, you know... It's the weird, the, nerdy, the, nerdy maybe the more feeble guy is yeah. actually capable of, you know, just as horrendous, monstrous acts as anyone. Sentenced to death, Pierce confesses all his accounts of murder and cannibalism to a priest, Father Connolly, before receiving his last rites. 
He was hanged at the Hobart Town Jail on 19th of July 1824. Supposedly, some of his final words were, Man's flesh is delicious. It tastes far better than fish or pork. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the story of Alexander Pierce, the two-time escapee of Macquarie Harbour Penal Station, and he's now known as the Van Diemen's Land Cannibal. Yeah. Clickbait. The Tasmanian Cannibal. Not clickbait, because he really did <laughs> eat a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was crazy. I, will, I, I stopped rooting for him after a while once I realized he had the taste, the fever, <laughs> of the kuru. We've had some good stories today that have, um... It shows you the, the, the difference, like, the different... They run effects. parallel without colliding. Mm. We explored, we learned everything about transportation. Yeah, weird. Ireland and the colonies in yeah, the shout early out to Ireland. You got featured 19th today. century. Yeah. No, if you know, this is the thing, like, it was weird. We hadn't pre-planned that. That's strange. So, yeah, are you, uh, are you midway through tunneling your way out of a prison using a pen? Are you carrying your baby up a ladder as we speak? Maybe <laughs> you've done time inside. Yes. Maybe you've actually escaped from prison. Maybe you found a wanted convict hiding in your back garden. Perhaps you are that convict in the garden, but still have time to email us your incredible story. Tell us your <laughs> weird escape stories. I mean, you know, have you ever had an escape situation? Because we have both definitely talked about the fact that we played games as children where we would, like, tie another kid to a chair and blindfold <laughs> them and they'd have to, like, wig wiggle free. You know, it was like we were preparing ourselves for kidnapping situations as children. Didn't you play a game that was oh, like yeah. old? Old man get those kids. Yeah. Tie each other up. It's not. It's fucked up. That's the nearest I've been, I think, to a, some kind of escape situation. Yeah, yeah. I've been pretty lucky. My sister one time ran away from a would be kidnap situation, but she was lucky because her boyfriend was coming to meet her. But yeah, I mean, tell us those kind of stories. Tell us your weird escape stories, etc. Make make sure you uh, rate, review, and subscribe to iTunes if you see us on there. Uh, but if you'd like to find any of our social media, previous or future episodes, or contact us or to see our references or sources, just go on head over to worldwearypodcast dot com. We send your uh, your stories, etc. to worldweary podcast at gmail.com you can find links for everything on the website all the social media stuff it's all on there it's the hub yeah maybe if you've got a few seconds take the time to rate us might might help us out a little bit get us uh give us some more free time to look at these stories <laughs> and we'll see you next time until next time bye